Yeah, welcome back to High Performance Computing, our lecture zero prologue. So kind of beginning of the course, a warm up to the course. And in the first part here, really, we basically discuss a little bit what high performance computing is, um, what are the materials, what are the modus operandi of the course with Canvas, with the Add Discussion Tool, and of course, the grading ideas of assignments and so forth. So the second part will be much more looking into the content. So usually the frequently asked question by students is, what is the content? So what are we talking about in the course? Um, obviously, in the prologue, we cannot go to many deep details. So many of these topics will be from a 10,000 feet perspective, still giving you a short indicator what all the different lectures will entail, what we will tackle throughout the lectures. Also think about that each of these lectures usually here and there has a practical lecture. So we see here in the prologue a much more theoretical overview um, of you know what the course content might be. But of course, think about that in the you know, couple of lectures we have ahead of us, especially those which are assigned um, basically to have material for your assignments um, will be very practical. There will be added you know, lectures, which are really practical lectures from me um, or from others that really give you insights how you basically deal with content for your assignments. So when you look at all of this, um, of course, um, think about that this materials has gone through students a long time now. So in presence, you see here an interesting view, which is in this pandemic, almost unthinkable here, uh, where we had a room of 50 students or so <laughs> filled uh, you know, with each little seat and actually people were standing in the course. So um, this is things where we learn from, right? Which is you. So in the end, uh, this was a student course um, shaping the material of this um, significantly. You see the kind of ideas, how we structure material of the course, how we do the assignments, how we do all the different topics in the course has been fundamentally changed since 2013. And then over 2017, 2019, all the material is in the meanwhile also online. So essentially you can go to my website, you can see almost, let's say 80% maybe of the material we will cover definitively in the course, because many of the things in HPC are quite, let's say, not conservative, which would be a wrong word maybe to convey this, but it's basically hasn't proven the test of time, right? Things like MPI, the message passing interface goes alongside HPC. Whenever you hear HPC, chances are the next one will be talking about MPI, we'll be talking about OpenMP, we'll be talking about GPUs and CUDA. So there's some certain, let's say, constructs, elements, and you know, domain decomposition of parallel computing, parallelization, scientific computing, these are all words or terms which you hear again and again. Obviously, these kind of topics um, really rarely change. What changes is the architectures of systems. Here and there are some new technologies, let's say network interconnects. Um, now everybody talks about Dragonfly and, and so on. So they're basically different ideas how you do networking, but the key essence remained that you have a high interconnectivity around the course and that makes it HPC. So speaking of the course, I would encourage you to go to the YouTube channel. You see the 2021 course, which is a new medium, um, basically popular much more these days than Facebook, Twitter or anything or websites. So that's why we also switch to this format and use YouTube these days for the community of HPC to also share our uh, teaching materials with all the community in HPC. And uh, if you're interested in different slides from the previous years, please go to our website to see more materials. Just the key message to take away is really, we learned basically based on your feedback. And I would also encourage you to give feedback to this course this time. Of course, we change with topics over time. We change with details here and there over time. Um, and as such, we also are still very highly interested in your feedback of the course. So please feel free to contribute to the midterm evaluation, but also to the end of year evaluation or give me personal feedback. 
um, as we are very broad in the community using this HPC course for not only US students, but also for many members of our HPC community, we are always open-minded to incorporate, let's say, new details and so on. So thinking of what we do then in the course, um, curriculum is essentially this couple of lectures I will go through now, um, a little bit boring here and there. And of course, understanding all the buzzwords going alongside might be a bit of challenging aspects because you really need to understand the lecture materials first. But it gives you a, let's say, 10,000 feet perspective of where we're going with the course, what the content might be, and what you can expect from the course. So obviously, um, one of our next lectures will be lecture one, so the real high performance computing starter lecture, where we basically will go into the more content idea of high performance computing. We will learn about four basic building blocks of computing, the top 500 supercomputing list, which means what are the high performance computing systems? What's the difference to normal performance, if you will? Um, the relationship to parallelization will be early on in the course and will be a constant factor essentially in all the different lectures. You will rarely find a lecture which has not an impact in parallelization because that's what we do, parallel computing on this HPC resources. We will also start with thinking about different architectures. And with this, you have so-called more traditional shared memory and distributed memory architectures, which are basic paradigms. But today, of course, there are many of those are hybrid. And we will learn about emerging architectures. We talked about the modular supercomputing architecture, for example. But we also will understand that all of those architectures in one way or another are basically driven or co-designed by parallel applications in order to form an infrastructure for science and engineering in order to tackle some interesting problems. So here we will see the more hardware perspective and perhaps of sort um, con conceptual ideas, while in the HPC ecosystems, we looking a little bit more into practice. So when we really want to program these systems, what we will face. So first of all, we will have lots of different software environments with a module environment, for instance, we will have scheduling. So different users at the same time want to use a supercomputer. So how we do this? And system architectures and data access will be different. You have catch levels down to basically uh, something like a tape archive. So we will understand that data access is not at all the same through all these different levels. Then we will understand what is a multi-core systems compared to a many core systems as GPUs network topologies, and of course, also thinking about more emerging computing paradigms and quantum computing and this modular supercomputing approach I mentioned before. Once we have seen this, let's say, overview of HPC and understand a bit more the architectures, we can go into the one first, let's say, very concrete idea of how you program those. And this is really a practical topic that in, in previous courses maybe would have not followed here, but learning from the idea of putting out assignments early, putting practical topics early for students to be interesting. We put the parallel programming with MPI very early here because you basically will program MPI significantly in the course. And with this, basically, we introduce that early to you, meaning what is the idea of MPI, why we need message passing and cannot access, let's say, shared memory anymore. Um, we will understand the power of MPI collectives. That is something which means like instead of having a so-called MPI normal message here with a sync and a source, you would have so-called collectives like reduce, like broadcast, or reduce, and so forth, that will basically face different processes with their memory all, uh, all at once. And with this, we understand a little bit the identity of so-called different processes with MPI ranks, communicators, and so forth. But with this indirectly also learn the whole idea of programming in parallel. So what it is with libraries, modules required to do, um, why it is needed to compile the code first and then have parallel execution with MPI to understand really what's happening. And of course, we have some bad and good code examples to show you how you do this uh, basically uh, efficiently, but because you can imagine that these collectives have been invited 
uh, to to help a lot of things in science and in this sense overcome lots of limits that you would otherwise do with let's say send and receive here you see um, in the simple message exchanges again and again so here and there we see that collectives can open uh, basically up a new world of programming instead of doing a lot of these normal simple exchanges and we will talk about it. Lecture three then gives us a little bit of jump back and think about what means parallelization. So why we do this? What's the benefit of let's say distributing one big problem to different cores as you see a little bit elaborated here. But then we also see common strategies for parallelization we will understand so-called Moore's law with the more theoretical aspects, which means also um, some interesting theoretical, um, let's say, equations that stand the test of time. So what happens if you want to have a serial and a parallelizable part of the problem and what are the limits? Um, there are two laws we will look into it, which is Andal's law here, basically for example. Um, which also means that the basically the the problem is in the serial limits of really the parallelizable uh, program part. So in the end, we are limits by the serial aspects of it, and we will you know go also through interesting domain decompositions the first time. So we think here about long range interactions of particles in physics, where you see the particles which are very close to one particle will be computed very much in detail, but those which are, let's say, the particles that form so-called a cluster and being maybe perhaps a little bit far away can be treated as one to save some computational time. And in this regard, you quickly are more a tree-based system of how you do parallelization. And we will talk about this as well in lecture three. Lecture four then picks up on MPI again. So we will see about the so-called MPI communicators much more in detail. We see here so-called Cartesian structure. Let's see um, what happens if you want to do program an ocean. And that will be one of the assignments in the call. A fishing basically assignment where you have to program, you know, basically fishing vessels that basically fish around the ocean. And you can imagine the ocean has waves and so on propagated through the ocean. And for this, the Cartesian structure here of this MPI communicator will help you a lot in order to program this or to let the boat go through the ocean to hunt fish and so forth. That's not obvious to you. We will see how that materializes once you have the knowledge. But of course, the Cartesian MPI you know, communicator, but many others are also very helpful in programming these parallel applications. And then the second part of it will be much more on I.O. You can imagine that when you have this parallel computing, lots of cores active, computing physical phenomena, you have lots of data to be processed or to generate. And there are different ways how to treat this I.O. If every processor here you see has some I.O., for instance, and create some data, basically, you come to a disk that has to create many different files, the so-called inode problem. If you maybe go to 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 cores in parallel and processors, you will see that the disks and the file systems usually cannot handle this. So what we basically have in the HPC community is so-called MPI IO parallel IO techniques, where you know basically these are all written to one of the elements in one logical file if you want and on the physical file of course it's all basically in different pieces but here it helps tremendously to let let's say all the different processes write into one file instead of creating several different files and we will talk about this of course in lecture four much more in detail and also one small part of the assignment will be part of parallel io the lecture from five is quite interesting. We will go much more into parallel algorithms and applications. Here you have a couple of those um, as let's say very trivial application parts, vector addition, matrix vector multiplication, just to understand the nature of parallelization. And once you, we do this, you quickly come to understand that the data structures underpinning this are also equally important. So we would have so-called basic MPI data types that support these operations quite significantly. 
You have so-called arrays and multidimensional data sets, and you can create even your own MPI data types just to avoid a repeated send maybe from all the different data sites. You have basically one interesting new type you created yourself in order to just once or twice, you know, put it over the wire to the next processor. And then we will learn also about the relationship to the parallel IO and the file systems with it. In lecture six, we kind of shift the view. So in the first five parts of the lectures, and we will have several practical lectures that underpin this, and also assignment one will be actually all about it. In lecture six, we shift the view. We will not anymore go to distributed memory program, but we will go to so-called shared memory programming. In other words, we go lower on the scale. We will keep the attention to one processor, but how we can use different threads of the processor in a principled way. And there's an OpenMP, let's say, de facto standard in the community, how you program shared memory um, systems with so-called parallel and serial regions. There's this very famous Pragma OMP statements where you can do things in parallel. You have different threads then actually targeting this, depending on the amount of threads you told to do so. And with this, you have a very interesting way of how to do parallelization. But the key theme will be that instead of sending messages back and forth that we had maybe an MPI, um, you will see that shared memory lives, of course, from the shared memory. That's what the name suggests. So basically, all the threads have access to the shared memory, can write, can read the variables. And with this, this programming paradigm is, of course, very fast using memory, but can be equally challenging if you think about lost updates, uh, race conditions about several variables. And that is all something we will talk about it when we talk about lecture six, critical regions and so forth. Then, of course, people today, when they have large scale codes, will basically combine these two programming patterns. So you would have message passing interface using here for communication across the different processors over some communication network. And within basically each of those, they will program OpenMP. And this makes it a hybrid programming application. And we will talk about this in le this lectures at different ways how to do it. Some of them are more recommended than others, vector mode versus task mode. So um, they are different, let's say, complexities if you really go for hybrid programming. Obviously, you can get the most out of the system, but you have to pay the price. If you do this, of course, it will be very hard to debug. It will be very hard to program, to have achieve a good load balance and so forth. But many of the applications today, which are very cutting edge in science engineering are hybrid codes. And in order to basically deal with this complexity, people have identified several different programming patterns. So one of this is basically that you see here, the so-called stencil based methods over time, where you have this kind of domain decomposition, maybe here a small Cartesian, but you see here also the timeline T0 and T1. And often in parallel computing, it's a point that in order to compute the next time step, the T1, you basically need the surrounding information of your neighbors from the previous time step, which is T0 here. So you see, we basically need the information from T0 to fuel T1 and to compute it. Could be a physical formula, could be, let's say, the heat dissipation in a room based on basically the time step before, what was basically the, the heat in the room before one time step of my neighbor cells and, of course, my own cell. And in order to compute that well, I need this information before. So this forces us, especially when we talk about distributed computing, distributed memory, to work with so-called halo regions or ghost cells. And we will talk about this also with some application examples in Lecture 7. Lecture eight then is a little bit about um, how software engineering takes place. And we will see that rarely people just throw a serial computing application on a HPC machine and then it's parallel. Um, quite the opposite, in fact. So you would think about a lot of, you know, programming before. And once you've done this, you basically, you know, starting with a cycle that is best explained here in this graphic, 
where you start with some measurements is really my application good enough or did I do some errors? You have some performance analysis tools like Vampire, like Scalaska that suggest tuning in this kind of parallel world. And then you do the tuning, you have an optimized application um, and, and you have integrated maybe here and there some patterns, but you do another measurement and maybe now the IO is a problem. So you go another performance analysis step, tuning, optimized application and so forth. So instead of repeating myself, you can imagine that tuning a HPC application, because it's awfully complex, going to thousand, if not, you know, multiple thousand, of course, doing to a thousand of accelerators today is a very complex endeavor. And with this, you know, the tool set supporting it with debugging, with profiling, and then with performance analysis tools is a very important part. And those goes for distributed programming that you see here. Maybe you send something and expect to receive something from a processor, which is this kind of deadlock that may some of you know from the name. Or you have this problem of lost updates that, you know, basically doing it in shared memory even and basically setting the same variable at the same time from different threads. And then a third thread wanting to read it, but, you know, can't be sure which one was really first, so-called race conditions. So we will here also look again into the problems of power computing. We will look into some tooling, how to support your programming if you want to be, you know, power programming at scale. Then lecture nine is, is interesting in many different ways. Here we talk about accelerators, graphical processing units, so-called GP, GPUs, general purpose graphical processing units. So many of you have probably used GPUs for gaming, Many of you know that GPUs have been very, you know, known from NVIDIA to do games, to do that. But basically, these days, GPUs are used with Kepler, Pascal, Volta, Ampere, the new architecture, really for scientific computing, for cutting edge technology, um, which has nothing to do with gaming, but rather for science engineering problems to be used every day. And we will talk about the differences between, you know, what is a multi-core system and a many-core system, what is now the advantage of the CPU versus the GPU and vice versa. So they all have the unique selling propositions, if you want. We will learn about some application examples. You see here one of our own research where we crunch down the training in deep learning significantly by using basically more and more GPUs and different nodes in parallel on the supercomputers, Jubels and Jureka using up to 96 GPUs in parallel in order to solve a scientific problem in remote sensing. So we will learn a little bit about this new technology and new is a loaded term. So GPUs have been now around since quite a while now. Um, other universities may have started even to do GPU courses with CUDA programming and so forth. But uh, here we keep it to a reasonable degree to understand what a many core system is before we then basically do a shift in the course and thinking about, you know, from technology, what we learned in the first part of the course from lecture one to lecture nine, what are now the different application areas where, you know, HPC makes a huge difference. Obviously, we cannot talk about all of them. We will pick many of them which have a very special case to show and which is then equivalent, you know, basically to use in different other domains. But here we start with lecture 10 in parallel and scale of machine learning, just because basically we just had lecture nine on GPUs and you will see that GPUs have a very big impact in deep learning these days. Essentially you would say you would don't do deep learning at all if you don't have GPUs. And if you have a plethora of GPUs, you have seen in the previous slide, we can break down the learning of deep learning significantly. What machine learning means, is of course a loaded term. You would have a complete course from Stain, for instance, in our course curriculums and Hofstein and so on. But here we will just have one, let's say, course and a rough idea of what machine learning is. We show you the basics of classification, clustering and regression. And of course, always would hint to other machine learning courses which have much more substance, um, theoretical conditions like basically statistical learning theory, which is important to understand. But here we see and give you some details about, you know, clustering algorithms. 
hear from one of my PhD students that graduated already, uh, that still, I think, holds that we have one of the highest scaling uh, clustering algorithms in the world on HPC. And here you see some work with support vector machines with me and another PhD student who is now, in fact, one of my postdocs and my deputy in the research group, uh, basically differentiating here between a satellite image of what exactly is each pixel. So you see each pixel could be a house, could be a water, could be a, some green area of sort. And that's what classification is all about. And we will learn about this basically in lecture 10 with a special emphasis, of course, where HPC can help. And then we continue with this with a little bit less of an impact maybe on deep learning alone. We will also learn that neurosciences and health have let's say, lots of benefits with deep learning. But uh, we also see a little bit a broader picture of HPC will bring across a specific aspect here in, in this lecture 11 of HPC, which is the role of containers. And many of you from cloud computing and big data from the course, I know many of you enrolled also to my HPC course here, but you will know that what, you know, Docker and singularity entails. But the point is here that HPC really didn't do that for quite a while. So it's a very new technology on these HPC systems. And we will look into this a little bit in the context also of brain applications, neuroscience applications, and where HPC can make a difference in health. Like for instance, the COVID-19 um, pandemic that is apparent right now and actually strikes a course like in the last year. But still, um, we will see also that, you know, HPC can make a difference here with the image analysis, but also maybe here in neurosciences with the cerebellum um, segmentation that we will learn about. In lecture 12, then we want to shift the view to so-called physical problems. So we go away a little bit from artificial intelligence. Again, we go to something which is governed by very known physical, um, you know, known physical laws and so-called numerical methods. So we will understand more and more why numerics is very important. We will have different methods to understand fluid dynamics like Navier-Stokes or Lattice-Boltzmann codes or so-called LES, uh, large eddy simulations. Um, and we'll understand how they can be used for car crashes, how basically they could be the basic principle to really understand how waves propagate on an ocean. And this will be also a little bit a part of your assignment to really do this fishing and also think about how waves propagate throughout your domain decomposition. Um, alongside with this, we learn a little bit the finite elements, the FEM, so-called, um, also in other areas of science and engineering, we will see um, that this mesh is a particularly important part, but also we will learn here, particularly in lecture 12, a little bit about this adaptive mesh refinement that you see in the smoke evolution, maybe of one of the HPC simulations, but you also directly see the turbulence on an aircraft here, which is the Airbus A340. Um, you see the turbulence to compute this, the mesh will be very irregular. So we don't do just a small Cartesian that we have seen uh, in the previous, but also think about a much more fine grained mesh. And this would be a kind of unique element in this course lecture. So in systems biology and bioinformatics, we really um, want to tackle two things. Of course, systems biology, bioinformatics, and also Pat Mousteth, he has a bioinformatics course, which I encourage you to take if you're interested in that domain. And here we will really um, have two elements really highlighted in the course. The first one is really dealing with uncertainty, thinking about that many of the things we do is, you know, dealing with uncertainty in systems biology. So we take the so-called Monte Carlo methods often in order to deal with this. And we will talk about this in this particular lecture 13 much more how it relates to so-called protein folding applications. Um, if some of you don't know really much about it, it's, it's of course understandable. Um, the protein folding and the understanding of misfolding of proteins is for instance, one of the causes to understand Alzheimer's diseases. So here, of course, HPC is uh, important to understand and basically uh, work with different foldings of these proteins to understand diseases. 
And as there are so many combinations and an infinite number, usually of how we can fold proteins, you have some so-called, um, you know, Monte Carlo methods to the rescues, and we will talk about it. Then, of course, in bioinformatics, it's a big role of databases. Um, we will have one application, which is a so-called BLAST parallel application, which is very much known in the field. But there are many others. But here we want to convey the message that databases, especially in bioinformatics, are very important. Um, the human genome and so on. We will take, you know, uh, ideas on gene sequencing and, and make the scientific case of it. And this will be one of the things we discuss. And with this, you get the bigger picture that actually systems biology and bioinformatics has to deal with enormous, enormous structure scales that you see here a little bit from spatial scales that we would say, you know, in meters like the human uh, to really understand the, the working of proteins, which are one of the workhorses in the body, right? If you are ill, the proteins come to the rescue. So they are on the, you know, nanometers. And then some of you heard about the synapses in your brains. It's on micrometers. Um, the brain regions, some of them dealing with emotions, some of them more for the logic. So all of these elements, of course, are on different areas of scale. And I think lecture 13 also sheds light on this to really understand a little bit more that our human body is amazingly complex. And with HPC, we have to deal on all those this, these different areas of scales from proteins, chromosomes, synapses, over to cells, microcircuits, brains, and perhaps the whole brain and then the whole body is the whole. But this is, of course, something which requires enormously computing. And that's why HPC is basically working on this significantly as well. And speaking of this scales, you will see in lecture 14, how we go really to the to the small worlds. I think lecture 14 is a very good in way of understanding what materials are all about, you know, drugs, if you want to, you know, have COVID-19 or other, let's say, drug discovery elements that you basically understand that, you know, if one drug is binding to, to some, you know, special, um, you know, idea of what a medicine could be, um, we will learn in this course what that means, molecular docking, and then if if even they will hold together in in a second, the problem is will they hold over time together? So we call that molecular dynamics. So there's a certain force field of these molecules that perhaps will also mean that basically the docking will be undocked, so that basically they cannot hold together. <coughs> and with this, we will have different libraries like NEMD, Amber. Um, uh, assisted model building with energy refinement with amber, you have really the force fields that you see here a little bit that in the end will derive many elements of how molecules work, of how medicine work, um, drug development work. And what we want to also convey with lecture 14 is a little bit this up in each year calculations from the beginning, but also show the um, enormous um, support really from different libraries. You see here, NumD, CPMD codes, MD, Ember, um, all of those have the unique selling proposition. And it's important in scientific computing to use them instead of potter off and create your own codes, your own libraries, you better suited or really reuse what's existing. And the final lecture from term of contact will be terrestrial systems and lecture 15. Here we want to understand if we model the world concretely and more precisely, what does it entail? And we have an example here of having, you know, the water in terms of atmosphere and then the water in terms of the land surface of, you know, the community land model here. And then the subsurface with power flow, all of those together will determine how the water flow really is in a certain terrestrial element. So here we basically have the idea of using parallel computing, but interconnect all of these different parallel computing codes with one of each other. It's a technique called coupling, and we will make the case for a so-called OASIS coupler, which is actually used by this power flow hydrology parallel application. So, and with this, we're coming to more and more realistic situations. Also thinking about the climate, the extreme weather problems we have in the US, especially just recently with some of the hurricanes, 
but also, of course, we've seen flooding, we've seen many different aspects in Germany. So all of this is something where, of course, we have to study. And uh, the numerical weather prediction we do already is one part of it. But of course, here we need much more detailed models. We need special models and libraries. And this will be also part of the second part of lecture 15. Now, at the final lecture, the 16th, is more an informal lecture where we ask the following aspects of the course. So what could be the jobs where you can engage into? What's the mindset in terms of job offers? on the market where you have been learned how to deal with those, let's say, uh, challenges. Then also the skill set will be one dimension where you think about you have learned a lot of HPC power programming. At that point, you may be also more for scientific computing in the end and want to do some science yourself. So there are PhD positions, master thesis topics we will talk about. And then the tool set we will reflect on what is the HPC systems tools, scientific computing libraries, maybe a 10,000 feet perspective, what we put in the course, what we left out, especially with accelerators, we will see there will be much more coming with different vendors. While we here maybe focus still a little bit on NVIDIA, we will see that AMD, um, MI100, there are different cards coming, which are not at all anymore the typical A100 cards or so from NVIDIA. And then, of course, we will see that the future is rich in terms of quantum computing. We do the initial publications already. I did, uh, I think, an introduction to quantum computing, one of the UT Messern here in Iceland, the technology and ICT conference a couple of years ago. And there's a lot of things to come. So it's a rich topic for you to study, and all of them are in one way or another bind to HPC. So just as an appetizer for those of you who already shaped the curricula early, which I also would in, you know, encourage you to do, there will be a fall 22 cloud computing and big data course. Some of you have taken that already here in the course from last year. Of course, this year will be another version um, where we do Azure, Amazon and Google, where we do, let's say, much more parallel machine learning and scalable machine learning, but also dealing with big data sets and so on. So if you have interest in that topic, I encourage you to take this particular um, course. It will be structured very similar like the HPC course you have seen today. And I think to close today, I would like to give you the warm welcome to the course as well. Many of the things sounds very theoretical, sounds complex, but it's also rewarding in terms of, you know, being part of Formula One in computing, being at the very forefront of computing, and basically having also fun along the way. And that's what really HPC is, what the HPC community is. If you go to ehpc.is and you will be all invited to one of our EHPC workshops in February and April. So you will see what I mean when I talk about community, being part of the team, maybe part of the penguins that you will see right now. With this, I thank you very much to engage in the course and we will hear us again in one of the next lectures. So enjoy the video. Progress report. High performance computing. Top secret. Top secret? Wait a minute, boys. I don't think so. Well, boys, looks like we have a job to do. Rico. <coughs> To get the message out about the importance of high-performance computing, codename HPC. Let's show them the kind of HPC that's being used to enrich our lives and gives companies a competitive edge. Status. It's no good, Skipper. I, I don't know the codes. Don't give me excuses. Give me results. I did it. From sophisticated weapon systems to homeland security to basic research across the sciences, high performance compute takes us to the frontiers of knowledge. HPC also enables groundbreaking innovation that creates high wage jobs and keeps America competitive in the 21st century. We've got a lot to cover from discovering solutions for disease to aerodynamic potato chips analysis. 
High performance computing is enabling designers and engineers to answer the what if questions that were simply impractical to answer even a few short years ago. The aircraft industry uses advanced computation to model aircraft wings, cabin ventilation systems, and engines for quieter, more fuel efficient planes. In the space program, high performance computing helped to determine the root cause of the space shuttle tragedy and is helping to make future space travel safer. HPC provides insight and answers to some of our toughest problems. Genius, pure genius. In a world of constant global market pressure, we must focus on innovation as a key component of our competitive strategy. And high performance computing is one of the best tools we have to drive the innovation process and raise our standard of living. We've only just scratched the surface. Kowalski, more data. In the oil and gas industry, high-end computing is required to process enormous amounts of seismic data so Earth scientists can better interpret our underground geology and extract more oil for greater energy security. HPC is also critical to the development of high-efficiency, low-polluting energy alternatives, such as hydrogen fuel systems. In the auto industry, HPC simulations are used to increase safety, reduce emissions, create more durable tires, improve fuel economy and passenger comfort, and even to design faster NASCAR stock cars. High performance computing is also driving the design and manufacturing of items we use every day. Companies are reducing the need for costly physical prototypes and bringing products to market faster while consumers are getting higher quality, more appealing and lower cost products. Looking good, troops. Physicists use HPC to understand and exploit the spin of individual electrons in order to make more powerful semiconductors. Advances in spintronics could lead to consumer products like an MP3 player the size of a pack of gum containing every song ever recorded. A skipper, pass the chips, please. One company even used sophisticated aerodynamic modeling to analyze the airflow of a Pringle. Pringles were literally flying off the manufacturing line, and HPC helped to solve the problem. Now that is one high-performing chip. Let's advance. What do we got? We take for granted having accurate weather forecasts. But did you know the extraordinary computational power that goes into creating these? Accurate forecasting of severe weather can mean the difference between life and death. And while they may not be right all the time... What the heck is this? Today, high-performance computers are allowing us to predict next week's weather on a global basis more accurately than the daily local forecast 30 years ago. Now this is more like it. You've heard the expression, swim like a fish. Researchers have modeled the dolphin kick used by champion swimmers. This new insight is helping to optimize the performance of top-level athletes. Can you keep a secret, my friends? Did you know that the United States Navy has used that research to enhance the performance of our elite forces? Of course not. It's just not natural. Humans shouldn't swim like dolphins. They should swim like penguins. Kowalski, it's time to break out the split screen. Beneath our cute and cuddly exterior is a kicking computing system. In the entertainment industry, HPC is enabling pure imagination to light up the screen like never before. From high-end visual effects to state-of-the-art CG animation, HPC has made an entire industry possible. Today, leading entertainment companies are using large compute clusters to empower their creative filmmakers. Creating high-quality CG animation can consume an extraordinary amount of processing power. Madagascar used more than 12 million CPU hours in the process of rendering. HPC is enabling films to be made today that were simply impossible to make even a few years ago. Thank you! Thank you very much! In medicine, high-performance computing is accelerating the discovery of new treatments for our most serious diseases. It has been used to perfect the design of a human heart pump the size of a AA battery and develop more effective cancer radiation therapy. HPC is providing new insights into how diseases like Alzheimer's systematically spread through the brain. Ever since scientists unraveled the mystery of the human genome, drug researchers have relied on HPC to sort through the millions of substances that could give the world its next breakthrough cure. 
It is even used to model the path of emerging epidemics through a city so that public health officials can stop the spread of potentially life-threatening illnesses. So to make sure it's all clear, Mr. Announcer, summarize. From medicine to consumer products, from energy to aerospace, HPC is accelerating breakthroughs to improve our lives and our competitiveness. The public and private sectors must continue to work together to harness the full potential of high-performance computing as an innovation enabler. High-performance computing is perhaps our most important weapon in remaining an economic superpower in the 21st century. The country that outcomputes will be the one that outcompetes. You are correct, sir. High-performance computing means high-performance business and high-performance lives. High five, low five, down low, too slow. Our work here is done, boys. HPC, mission accomplished. This also is the end of the prologue, and I will come you back to the next lecture, um, basically tomorrow. Thank you very much, and talk to you soon.